Welcome to the EW Podcast. My name is Eric White, and this is a new little project I'm starting where I will be exploring topics regarding the mind, um, ranging from therapies to stories of people overcoming trauma. Um, and that's the kind of story we actually have today. I'll be talking to my friend John Russell, who goes by JR. Um, in this podcast, we talk about his work as a professional photographer. Uh, we chat about his photography company perspective, where he takes aspiring photographers on trips around the world, like summiting Mount Kilimanjaro. They also do work with children in Cambodia um, who have been rescued from sex trafficking. We get a little bit into that. And then we kind of switch gears halfway through the podcast and start talking about the trauma he experienced in his early 20s, uh, where his mother attempted suicide and eventually passed. Um, I really love JR and I love his story. And I think it does a great job of showing um, how a person can take an event in their life that is uh, on the surface very negative and very sad and tragic and, and ultimately uh, make it work for them and make it something that they use in their life to do great good. And just a couple of notes about the podcast itself. I do apologize for uh, the horn sound that you'll hear intermittently throughout this. Um, I didn't anticipate how loud this train would be that passes outside of our apartment, but you can definitely hear it. It's a little distracting, and I apologize for that. Also, I will be posting links to JR on social media and his online presence on the blog. You can go to www.theewpodcast.com um, and find the posts with this podcast, and there will be the links. So, yeah, without further ado, here is my conversation with JR. Good, good. I'm doing good. I'm here with uh, John Russell. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Nice, man. Thanks for taking the time to chat. Yeah, no, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, so I guess just a quick little background. We met at Lightning in a Bottle Music Festival, kind of serendipitously. Um, and... I think we, uh, yeah, I really connected with you. I was doing video stuff then and we just got to chatting. And so when I started thinking about this podcast, kind of your story and, you know, the things we talked about there at LIB um, were something that I thought would be an interesting topic to discuss. So, yeah, thanks again for talking to me. Yeah, yeah thanks for having me on. So can you just give a little background about what you do with your photography? Um like your day to day kind of and who you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, name's John D. Russell, professional photographer and digital media marketing professional, um, based in Manhattan Beach, California, uh, basically a, a suburb of Los Angeles. And um, it's been an interesting uh, uh, journey uh, doing what I do. But um, yeah, I primarily shoot uh, stills and video. Um, for small, medium, and large-sized businesses throughout the world, um, telling their stories, cap capturing the essence of their brands to help communicate and sell their products and services. So uh, my client list includes uh, Toyota, Ford, Skechers, um, here in the U.S. and, and abroad, uh, companies like Mind Valley, uh, based out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, um, uh, a couple of resorts in the Caribbean and so I've got clients all over the world but um, yeah I basically help them with their digital media uh, content creation and in some cases go as far as uh, helping with strategy and and some other things so a bit of a serial entrepreneur so I've got a couple of things going but the uh, the commonality in all three of my businesses is photography visual media and you're self-taught right is that correct 
Uh, did you go, did you go to school for photography? I, I didn't. So actually, it's funny because I I, I learned photography in the dark room. Um, I actually took a photography class my freshman year in high school, and uh, I actually got a D <laughs> in the class. Which is, I still laugh about it. I don't know how you get a a, a failing grade in in a subject like art uh, or photography <laughs> since it's supposed right. to be subjective, but. Uh, you know, and he was an auto shop teacher too, and 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 so he was more of like the trades professor at that school. So um, it was really discouraging, to be totally honest. And I put my camera down, uh, played sports, and you know, did other normal type things, and um, kind of got back into it as just a creative outlet. Uh, I used to do a lot of like landscape photography with film because um, I grew up in the outdoors doing a lot of backpacking and hiking and stuff so oftentimes i would just take my uh a 35 millimeter film camera out and shoot um shoot photos for fun but uh so i have i had a little bit of training in, in photography but you know many years ago um when i decided to be a professional photographer um i really did have to teach myself a lot of things that i would forgotten um, and new medium, right? So it went from film to digital. So having to right. kind of learn, learn, uh, digital photography versus, versus black and white, um, 35 millimeter film. And going, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. But no, I actually have a degree in accounting. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> did you ever, did you use your degree after school? Um, I use it every day. In my business, you know, it's actually one of those people always laugh at me. Why did you do that? And um, there's a story behind that. But ultimately, um, you know, I wanted I went back to college as an adult. So I didn't go back to college until I was 27. Um, and so for me, taking that time, the, the financial resources to go back to school and get a degree, I wanted to make sure that it was was something that um I felt had value and would serve me in the long run, no matter what I did in my life. And accounting is just one of those topics. It's it's really the the language of business, um, you know. And I believe it gives me a competitive advantage, to some degree, because um, I have a business background, not not necessarily an art background. Um, I have a lot of friends and colleagues that are struggling creatives and. I think that they struggle in running a business and I feel like that's something that I actually right. excel in. Hmm. That's interesting. That makes total sense when you put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of your businesses is taking people to learn photography abroad, right? Yeah, I actually run a local photography group um, that's really geared and, and marketed towards amateur photographers. I, I love to teach. I love to share my experience and, and how I see the world with others. Um, so I, I run a, a, a local photography group here in Manhattan Beach uh, called the South Bay Photography Group. And then um, I also, as you mentioned, I, 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 a division of my company called Perspective, uh, where I take people on adventure travel uh, trips around the world and I teach them photography along the way. So like uh, a typical itinerary could be um, going to Africa, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, and then going on a photo safari afterwards. Um, I'm currently working right now to plan a trip to summit Mount Elbrus in Russia and do some motorcycle uh, adventure touring, uh, either before or after, but still kind of ironing those details out. But yeah, I, um, I love travel, I love photography, um, and I love giving back, philanthropy. So all of those things really comprise perspective first of all how big are the groups that you're taking and what's like the skill range of people that, that go with you yeah most of most of my clients are beginner photographers and really just looking to have a wonderful experience to be able to give back but also to learn more about photography um, and also it helps that you've got a professional photographer along with you mm -hmm. um, so that you get these epic photos um, during the experience so um, group sizes, uh, I shoot for about eight, um, but you know, you can have a standard deviation of, of two. Um, but typically I won't run trips if they're smaller than four and, um, they get a little bit, uh, difficult to manage if they're larger than 12. So eight's about the sweet spot. 
Cool. And how those are? How often are you doing those? Once a year, about? It depends on my year. It depends on my schedule mm -hmm. and and just how it all lines up. <clears throat> um, but I try and have two offerings each year. Oh, cool. So like a beginning of the year and end of the year type thing, or just random? Yes, it's it's not even like I, I wish I could say that they were completely planned out, but um, a lot of times it's just clients will approach me and say, "Hey, um, I'm interested in doing this. Do you know how we can do it?" So sometimes it's it's actually client fed. Oh, cool. And sometimes it's just my experience. So before I put on trips, I actually go through them myself. So there's I have to spend the money and the time to go through and and create the connections and. Um, uh, formulate like a, a really solid heartfelt itinerary um, and then once I do that then I can come back and, and sell it discuss with people get people excited about it cool that's awesome it's a long long process <laughs> long expensive process rather do you have people um, on the ground in the places you're trying to go helping you to put these together or are you the one that's making all these connections kind of as it goes um, so I'm fortunate that I've, I've spent the last decade of my life really building an international tribe. Um, so I literally have friends uh, all over the planet. Um, and so usually first steps is reaching out to them and seeing what connections they have and seeing if they can connect me to anyone that can help facilitate. Um, and then once I'm on the ground, um, some of it's organic just by the experiences that I have and the people that I meet. Um, mm -hmm. And some of it's just based on um, like cold calling, um, but more mm -hmm. or less, it, it's usually a warm referral or a, a personal connection or a personal experience that I've had with a specific vendor or, or a service provider. Um, but like uh, in the instance of Africa, like going on an Africa safari, it, it, it's, it's a pretty complex itinerary and it takes time to build those relationships. So um, because I've got... Um, a guide and so like a group of let's say five trekkers can have roughly 22 porters and two or three local guides so it's a huge team what's a porter someone that carries your stuff okay um so it, it's a good source of revenue for the local economy like a sherpa kind yeah of. exactly exactly um but and then and then there's a whole another aspect for the safari I have to hire guides, I have to hire vehicles, I have to make sure that uh, park fees and, and taxes and everything's all paid for and covered. Um, so it's, there's a lot to it. It's, um, uh, it's not an easy uh, venture, but it's, it's, for me it's more did, a labor of love. Um, do you ever find like situations when you're out there traveling and on these adventures that things are maybe more extreme than participants have signed up for? Is there ever a situation where they're like, oh, I don't know about this? <laughs> or is it is it everything pretty well broadcasted up front? And... Yeah, I'm big on uh, being clear and about expectations. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very clear about what they can expect. And I, I make sure that they're as, as prepared as possible for, for what they're about to encounter. So um, I recently just partnered up with a, a friend of mine. We're doing vintage motorcycle tours in India. And I was just I was just there for five weeks, um, and my role in the company is to handle the experience capture element of it. So, um, the, our competitors in that space, their experience capture is limited to a motorcycle guide with a cell phone. Right. Um, that's about the extent of the content that you receive from your experience. So we we take that a, a, a much further, and so we actually have professional media professionals along the trip with you so we're flying drone mm. we're shooting video and capturing stills and essentially making each rider or each guest a hero um so they have their own takeaway so um in that instance i mean i literally just got my motorcycle license the day before i went to india <laughs> the, the first time i had ever ridden a road bike was was from delhi to the taj mahal in agra so it was about you know a six hour ride um, and fighting the, the traffic of Delhi, which is, which is infamous. But, uh, so that was pretty extreme for me, but, um, I'm proud to say I, I handled it well and, and, uh, <laughs> came back home alive and had a blast doing it. So, but in terms of guests, like, uh, no, I've never had anyone, you know, completely out of their element. 
Um, anyone that's signing up to Summit Kilimanjaro is, is, is very, I, I make sure to educate them about the potential risks um, mm -hmm. and consequences. And, and kind of as a, as a kind of a backup, I require all of my clients to have um, travel insurance and extreme travel insurance r that makes sense for the activities that we're doing. So that's a real thing. Extreme. Travel oh yeah. Insurance. Yeah. 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 So for Kilimanjaro, it's, um, because you're summiting a mountain, um, that's the that Kikilia essentially, <clears throat> um, there's a specific, uh, rider or type of policy that will cover the, uh, insured, for scaling mountains over a specific altitude. Hmm. Um, so there is specific high-risk insurance policies short-term for international travelers. So there's a handful of companies that offer those types of things, but we just I make it mandatory that everyone's covered so that in the event of an evac or um, you know something, an accident or something, that they have the means to get themselves cared for. So it sounds like a lot of that particular venture is spent planning <laughs> and spent just getting all the ends together for these trips. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think anyone can relate to this if you ever like, you know, donned a backpack and jumped on an airplane and said, you know, I'm going to go travel Thailand or Bali or somewhere amazing for a while. Like, if you've ever done a trip like that, you understand how much logistical information there is to absorb. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's a lot and it's a big responsibility. It's something I take, you know, very seriously because I, I certainly, you know, I want everyone to have an amazing time. I want to push everyone's limits. I want to kind of yeah. get them uncomfortable, but I don't want them, you know, I want them to be safe. Um, so safety is, is paramount. Right. And you're not, you're not exactly doing anything that's like so ridiculously extreme. Like Kilimanjaro is a pretty it's one of the tallest peaks, right? But it's not, it's not an intense climb. Like I think we were talking about how you're not necessarily like bouldering or anything at any given point. Yeah. Kilimanjaro is, is what I would call a long hike. Um, it's, it's not technical. Um, you don't need to, uh, wear crampons or ice axe. You don't need to necessarily be versed in, in self rescue. Um, you just need to be physically fit and able to walk for extended periods of time in high altitude environment over mm -hmm. the course of multiple days. So, um, in that case, no, but riding a motorcycle in India, true, that can kill you. So it, it's, but you know, it's like getting in your car at home on the 405 can kill you. So it, it's all, you know, we, we take the steps to keep everyone safe. Um, but, uh, undoubtedly the trips will get become a little bit wilder and wilder, like upcoming <laughs> with Russia, we've got Elbrus, the plan is to summit, and then we're going to ski and snowboard down. Whoa. Um, and then from there, likely jump on some motorcycles and do some, some, some adventure touring and camping. Um, so like those things are inherently risky. Um, yeah. you know, uh, I have my eyes on uh, Aconcagua in Argentina, which is, I think it's 21,000 feet um, and change. Um, but that's a big technical mountain, and everyone mm -hmm. will need to have specific training. So we'll be offering training sessions uh, probably in Washington State um, for people to get comfortable with using an ice axe, with using crampons, with, with, so that they're, they have the skills to, to succeed. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of it. I think it's, it's good to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. I think that's where we grow the most, um, is when we're uncomfortable. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to live life comfortably, have a routine, come home and sit in your warm, cozy house, watch TV, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, through my life and my life lessons, I don't, I don't really live that way. So I like to, to take risks, but they're calculated. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, it, it, it's just kind of part of me and it's what I like to do. How much of like what you're planning, um, and the, like you said, things get maybe a little bit more risky every time. How much of that is just you kind of wanting more and, um, a, like, how is that? It seems like that might be just a reflection of what you want necessarily. Right. And you're trying to bring other people up along with that. Yeah. I, well, I think, you know, it, it's, it's like skydiving. 
um, or really anything. So like, uh, I remember when I was learning to drive where I live, I live by the beach, there's lots of hills and I had to learn on a stick shift, a manual transmission vehicle. Mm -hmm. And I was petrified that I would pop the clutch, stall the car, roll backwards and just like crash into everyone behind me lower on the hill. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, there was this fear. Um, that I encountered before I even tried, because I just, I'm, or, you know, I made up the worst case scenario in my mind before I even attempted it. Um, but with, with time and practice, you get comfortable, right? And mm -hmm. then that becomes no big deal. You do it second nature. It's very much like skydiving. The first 50 times you jump out of an aircraft, it might really right. scare you. But, you know, that 51st time, and it's different for everyone, but eventually... Um, your you just become it becomes a norm. Um, mm -hmm. So, in terms of what I do for my trips, I will never put anyone in in danger because of my own ego or desire to 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 make my Instagram pop. I don't think any of it is really. I mean, yeah, I curate these trips, and a lot of it is they're places that I think are interesting. But mm -hmm. as I kind of mentioned before, I actually have clients coming to me and saying, Hey, when are you going to do this? So some of it's input from clients and some of it's just my own desires. Um, and a lot of times it's really focused around kind of bucket list type of activities. Like Kilimanjaro is, is, is pretty high on a lot of people's bucket lists. Um, so, you know, those types of trips, they're, they're easy to market. Um, because they're kind of something that a lot of people do. So um, right now, that's kind of where we're at. Eventually, over time, it'll get more refined and more unique. Um, my goal has ultimately been to build trips that you can't really just Google hmm. um, because that's I, like there's already those service providers that do those itineraries. Like I don't want to compete with that. Um, so I don't. So everything that we do, um, and even, even the Africa safari, I have my own spin to it. So there's certain things that you could only accomplish going with us versus any other outfitter. And that's because of the relationships that I've invested time and energy and, um, nurturing and, and getting these cool experiences together. So, um, and there, there is also a philanthropy side to the trips as well, isn't there? Don't you spend time, um, doing some, some sort of effort? Yeah, yeah, that, that's always been the intention. So uh, as a photographer and a storyteller, um, I've worked with, I work with an organization in Cambodia called Sanoa that their mission is to stop human sex trafficking in Asia and Cambodia specifically. Um, and they're actually based in Orange County. Um, but I've been to Cambodia and I've, I've seen the safe houses, uh, the safe house rather, and I've met some of the kids that have been rescued and they're under lock and key and protected and they're taught life skills so that they can enter back into the world with a skill set so that they don't fall back into poverty and essentially pushing them back into um, slavery, if you will. And mm -hmm. um, they've taken it a further step where they've um, created kids clubs in, in impoverished villages and it's free. And these kids can come and learn. And if they stick with the program, they're even offered financial assistance to keep going through school. Because in a place like Cambodia, it's up to the teacher whether or not they want that kid in the class. And oftentimes, unfortunately, those teachers take bribes. So in Africa, is, it's unique. But I've been there and, and working with the school that, that, that just caters to uh, an oppressed village um, on the island of Zanzibar. And, um, you know, it, it's, so yes, we try and have a philanthropic component to every excursion. My goal is to give back to the economies that we're visiting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy for tourists to take, even though we're support with our money. But like a lot of travel tourism is just, you go and you leave. You don't really leave your mark. Um, and so we're really trying to build relationships with organizations in the spots that we travel um, to give back. And that could be photographers on the ground creating content and telling stories so that they can leverage said uh, media assets for their own marketing purposes. It could be something along where we come back and curate a gallery and have an auction, and then that money is donated to the organization. 
Um, so yeah. every organization is a little bit different, and it ultimately depends on how much time we have. Um, but but absolutely, every 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 expedition that we do um, is giving back to the local economy in some capacity. Um, the more that we build up, and and the more trips that we're doing, and the longer that we're doing it, we believe that we'll we'll make a better impact. Um, but there's things that I strive to do, like bringing technology um, to the masses, especially in poor rural villages. The challenge there is connectivity. Um, it's one thing to have a computer, but if you can't connect to the internet, um, you know, it becomes not a handicap, but you're not leveraging technology to its, to its full potential. So there's with, with, with things like, Fiverr and Elance and all these crowdsourcing um, platforms that, that do decent work or good work um, at a low price point, uh, I think is, is really a wonderful thing for the quote unquote gig economy that's emerging. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a wonderful way to, to help um, people teach them skills, teach them how to you know, use design tools, teach them how to use Photoshop, teach them how to create a logo, teach them how to build a website, teach them how to, you know, what social media marketing is all about. Um, these things are, you can teach them. And not only that, with the access to the internet, you can learn a lot more um, than you ever could before about all of these topics, right? Um, I, YouTube University <laughs> is, is, is an amazing platform um, for people to learn and, and, you know, about certain skills or trades. And so I think, you know, one of my missions is to, to bring technology to some of the places that we go to, to empower these people um, and give them more opportunities to make money and support their families and, and grow their, their local economies. Um, so, you know, but that's, it's a long tailed, it's, 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 it's out there, you know, but uh, I'm working with a company right now on this Russia expedition and they're currently in Nepal distributing 40 computers that were donated by Microsoft. So, um, you know, baby steps, we're going to get there. We're going to make a big difference. We're halfway through the hour already. And I do want to spend time on, um, your mother and how, you know, your trauma that you went through. Cause I think that's like one of the most interesting parts of your story is how you've been able to do all these amazing things and help all these people discover photography, help people in other countries improve their lives. And it's all from this foundation of pain that you have dealt with and learned from. And I just think that's super powerful. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's an intense story. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, my takeaway, well, and I'm still learning and still growing and still, still fighting the fight, but, um, you know, it's a journey. It's not a destination. But uh, ultimately, I think uh, traumatic incidents and events in your life can, are usually the impetus or the catalyst for, for massive change. Um, and that's, you know, your push to your limit and it, it really makes you reassess your life and what you're doing and what's important to you. And so, um, I feel like I'm fortunate that I, that I learned a lot of those lessons earlier in life than most. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a long story. Um, but, uh, so I, my mom raised me, she was, uh, an amazing mom, extremely supportive. Um, when I played sports, she was at every game. I mean, she was that mom. She was always there, leaving work early and, and just always showing up for me. She was very supportive and, and wonderful. Um, but, you know, my father was never around. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that it bothered me so much in high school or whatever. But uh, when I went to college, I was having some trouble in my life. And I, I was just feeling a bit lost and um I don't know why, but just harboring a lot of anger and like, but it was deep stuff that I didn't even really know was there that, that, that started to surface in my college years when I first went to college. And so one, one year, I think it was, I don't know, about 21, I think I, about 21, I asked my mom to find my dad because I just wanted to meet him. And, uh, ultimately she did. And, um, they reconnected and, and, and started dating and, 
and um, it was all a bit odd. Um, but ultimately, that didn't end up so well. Um, my dad was 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 taking support from my mother financially, emotionally, living together, um, and meeting other people um, on the internet. So. I found out about it. I asked my mom, you know, basically like we need to, this isn't okay. He's taking advantage of you. Like you need to tell him to move on. Um, and so she did and he ended up taking off and and moving in with uh, another woman and it broke my mom. So, uh, long story short, she, she tried to kill herself. She dissolved a hundred aspirin in a glass of water and drank it. And then laid around the house for a couple of days, writing me suicide letters. And her plan was to, have the myself and her older sister and two uh, nieces by her side um, while she passed on. But we ended up uh, <laughs> basically, um, you know, forging power of attorney. I, I forged power of attorney, pulled the do not resuscitate order, and had the doctor save her life. And it kind of backfired. And she was angry about it um, because now she had to answer um, some really difficult questions, um, from some people that she loved very much. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, she was, she was suffering from clinical depression. So I don't even know that it was my mom actually doing those things, but she was clinically depressed, diagnosed and and just really struggling in her own right. And, um, she felt like that was, that was the answer for her. Um, and you know, I was 21, I was a kid and, um, reading those letters, Mm -hmm reading those letters from, you know, from what I thought was the one person that always had my back, um, was, was tough. Um, I felt, uh, I felt crossed. I felt a lot of things, but I did the right thing and I hung in there and I became my mom's primary caregiver and just took care of her, fed her three fresh meals a day, um, from scratch and just nurtured her back to to health. Unfortunately, the stunt put her in end stage liver failure so she she needed to um, get on a transplant list. So we got her on the transplant list, and unfortunately, it's just a waiting game because um, when you sign, you know, unfortunately, there's not a lot of organ donors um, relative to the people that need organs. Um, so the, it becomes a waiting list, and then they have to create all these like metrics or algorithms to determine who qualifies based on like basically you can't be too sick but you have to be sick enough. So it's a very small window where you can qualify for an organ. And um, we waited. We waited a little over five years, and um, my mom slipped into a coma, and uh, I begged the transplant coordinator at, at uh, UCLA to transplant her, and um, they did. You know, she was 49. She had two master's degrees. She didn't drink or smoke. So my argument was, if you're going to give anyone a, sec- a second opportunity at life, it should be this woman. She she deserves it, and 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 uh, they did. They transplanted her, and um, she woke up the next day, and um, it was it was all pretty pretty surreal, pretty intense. Uh, it, was, it had been a long five so year battle, um, and just getting to that point. So the liver was taking, but she had a pesky lung infection. And, um, unfortunately my mom didn't make it and she, she passed away 31 days, uh, post liver transplant, uh, in ICU. Um, and we all thought she was going to make it. It was, it was a big shock and, um, you know, in in a blink of an eye, I pretty much lost my only family. Mm. And, um, it was, it was a really challenging time in my life and, and something that was, uh, very difficult. And hurt, 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 hurt a lot. Um, but uh, after I was going, you know, I had to take care of her belongings in two different states and sort out funerals and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I was going through her belongings and I, I stumbled upon her family photos. And um, someone had asked me a couple of years prior in the middle of all this, if I could do anything in the world, what would it be? And my response was travel the world and take photos. Um, At the time, I didn't feel as though I had that luxury because I needed to be, I felt like more stable. And so I worked for an insurance company as an underwriter in Los Angeles, very white collar, complete opposite of of what I wanted to do with my life. But Mm -hmm. uh, it helped me. It kept me 
grounded and structured and gave me something to focus on and and I was good at it. Um, so it was kind of at that moment where I decided, you know, I really wanted to pursue photography. It resonated with me. The only thing I had left of my family were in these photos and, um, just going through hundreds of photos. My mom did a wonderful job of taking photos, but also archiving them. And, um, it was a real treat for me because I was just able to go through them and I was just very thankful for it. So, um, I quit my job as an underwriter almost like a week later and um, I went back to college and I pursued my degree in accounting. Um, And uh, while I was doing that, I was apprenticing for a wedding photographer in San Diego and I basically shot, I think we shot 13 or 15 weddings that season um, and I did it all for free. Uh, And I just wanted to learn how to use my camera and while wedding photography was not my uh, intended niche <laughs> that I wanted to jump into. Um, I am thankful for the experience because wedding photography teaches you to act quickly on your feet because lighting changes, people are moving. And so you really have to have a, uh, an exceptional command of your, your gear. You have to know how to use your camera. You have mm-hmm. to know how to use a flash. You have to know how to bounce flash. Um, so it was, it was a crash course in, in photography for me. Um, and progressively through the season, I got a lot better at, at what I was doing. And the following year, I went off on my own and started my own photography business. That was 2006. And I was just basically shooting part-time while I was, while I was going back to college. Mm. And uh, once I graduated, I had a degree in accounting. And it was like, well, now what, right? Now it's, <laughs> now it's time to make a decision. Um, what am I going to do with this? And um, I reached out to my old boss. We talked. He offered me a, a good job high paying salary opportunity for advancement. I'd already worked at the company, so they'd already known me. Um, and it was a good opportunity, but I decided to turn it down. And, uh, instead I, I slept on my friend's floor for six months <laughs> mm. uh, and, and used social media to build my photography business. And I had a very small goal of a certain, uh, dollar amount that I needed to make every week in order for me to get up and move out of my buddy's house from living on his floor to renting a room. And, um, and so that was my goal was just make enough money to, to get off the floor. And, um, I did that really quickly. And, um, you know, six months I was, was kind of off on my own and a little bit more stable. Um, and, um, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's essentially my story and kind of what had happened to me and, 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 what, what kind of drove me to, to do what I do now. Um, when I started shooting professionally, I was shooting mostly weddings and family portraits. Um, for, for any photographers or aspiring photographers or videographers, if, if you want to make a living using your camera, it, it's, I check out those in, that industry because it's, um, there's plenty of people getting married and it's a good, it's a good way to, to learn business and to learn how to use your gear. Mm -hmm. Uh, that said, I'm not suggesting you go tell everyone you're a professional photographer when you're, when you, when you're not, um, but, uh, you know, go apprentice, go work for someone, go carry someone's bag. It's an interesting industry. Um, and it can definitely, uh, create a wonderful career for, for those that are, that are into it. Um, over the years as a photographer, I've, I've been fortunate and, um, through a lot of networking and hard work, um, I've been offered a lot of amazing opportunities that have kind of brought me out of shooting weddings per se. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, I still shoot family portraits. They're pretty seasonal right now. I'm kind of in the thick of holiday portrait season, but it, it resonates with me. And, and I, I really pride myself on being able to take photos for, for families that they can, re- you know, keep in their family for generations. And when their right. kids, up, they have those photos, but it's all, it's a small segment of my business these days. Um, now I, I really focus on more, uh, commercial corporate type work. So photography mm. for businesses. Um, but I, I still do the, uh, the, the family portraiture because it, it's, I, it's close to my heart. What role do you think like your experiences, you know, surrounding the time of your mom's passing and, you know, your life then what, how do you think that plays into 
um, your drive and your what you've been able to do for yourself. Because if you look at it on the surface, you would think, oh, I don't know if this guy is going to figure it out. seems like he's been through a lot. And then you end up, you know, doing a bunch of cool things. How do you like explain that? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, so I'll tell you straight up, like uh, for about a month after my mom passed, I, I started getting into some destructive behaviors. Um, nothing aggressive or like nothing that was going to hurt me or kill me, but it was just, well, actually, I don't know, but like, you know, <laughs> drinking too much or whatever, like trying to escape and drown your pain. Um, I realized very quickly that that wasn't going to get me anywhere. I was hurting inside. Um, but, but those things weren't, weren't helping me. They weren't, they weren't making me feel better. They were just making me forget. And then, you know, so I'm really quickly within one month of my mom passing, I made a pact with myself that I wouldn't let it destroy me, that I wouldn't be a victim and that I would take ownership in my story and that I would do the best that I possibly could to honor not only myself, but, but my mother and, and the sacrifices that she made um, for me. And um, also to everyone else in the world and all of my friends and people that look up to me or people that don't look up to me, but the people that are in my life, I owed it to them to not fall apart. Um, it would have been easy for me to play a victim. This happened to me, so it's okay if I'm you know, an asshole or a degenerate or whatever but I, I made a pact that i wasn't i wasn't gonna be a victim um even now when i share my story people say oh i'm so sorry and i say don't be i'm proud of it i own it um it's not glamorous it's not storybook but it's my life you know and that those experiences have, have really taught me so much and um i can honestly say i'm just i'm proud of myself for 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 not crawling under a rock for not being a victim and 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 you know for for doing the right things and living the life that i know i'm capable of um and i think it's 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 important it's an important lesson because we all have things that happen to us we all have our stories we all have loss right like i'm not unique my story may be unique but my loss is important to me but it doesn't mean that, you know, anyone else's loss is less important. It's equally important. Um, and we all deal with stuff in a different way. But, um, you know, it happens. And it's, 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 it's important that when, when negative things happen to us or what we deem as negative at the time, that, you know, we remember that, that you know, they're life lessons. And it, it's all about how we react and how we carry ourselves and, um, and how we handle, handle our business, you know, um, emotionally. And, um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I, a good friend of mine, when I was going through all of this years ago, you know, he said, thank you to me one day. And I was like, for what, you know, <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, and he said, you know, thank you for showing us how to handle this when it, when our time comes. Hmm. And I was blown away. I didn't think anyone was looking at it like that. I wasn't mm -hmm. even looking at it like that. I was just trying to get through each day without, you know, <laughs> like just, it was just soul crushing event. Like it was just a really mm -hmm. tough chapter in my life and, uh, you know, surviving and just getting through each day was hard enough. And for someone to approach me and say, thank you. And like, basically tell me that, you know, you just showed us how to do this with style and grace is like, I, I still don't even know what to say to it, but I, I think it's an important comment because, and he's so smart for saying that because he understands that it's going to happen to all of us. Like with, with life comes death, right? Like we're all going to die. Um, and everyone that you love is going to die. And that's, it's a very dark sobering thing. If you look at it in that fashion, but it's also a beautiful thing because it's a good reminder. It should be a good reminder that, life truly is precious and you just we don't know how much time we get we can't predict it and so whatever you want to do in your life if you want to go climb kilimanjaro or jump out of airplanes or ride a motorcycle in india now's your time um now's the time to do those things and you owe it to yourself and everyone around you um to live to your full potential and if you have dreams don't squash them go get it you know and oftentimes it takes these radical events in our lives to give us that perspective right. um, and it, it's kind of unfortunate 
but it's also a beautiful thing. And I, I, you know, when I see other people living their lives and and going through these traumatic events or um, experiences that have shaped them, um, I have the, you know, the utmost admiration and respect uh, for people that that put themselves out there and go go after what they want. Um, Because I think it's important. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, they don't do what they want for one reason or another and they end up regretting it. Um, And... uh, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that regret alone can kill someone. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if, if 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 you internalize it enough, right? Like, if you beat yourself up for not doing X, Y, Z, um, over time, that that negative talk, that negative self talk, can be detrimental to your health. Um, it, it changes your frequency because it, it it's not about love and compassion; it's about regret and fear. Um, and, and being able to separate those things and, and go one way versus the other is, to me, a, a wonderful ability if you can just, you know, it, it's like doing the shadow work. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's hanging around in the dark space and finding that light, um, you know, because a lot of times it's, it's inspiration, you know, and, and I know you're an artist and a lot of, uh, a lot of artists historically throughout time you know, they, they come from a place of pain um, and it, it's it's a whatever their medium is a vehicle for expression. Thank you for uh, committing to sharing your story and everything. I think that's really powerful for anyone who might be, you know, dealing with a loss of any kind. Um, but was there something during that time that you were doing specifically? I know you said you made a pact with yourself to not um, become a victim or let, let that steer your life. But was there anything else that you were doing at that time besides, you know, promising yourself that was, were you going to therapy? Were you meditating? Like it really wasn't. I mean, for me, it was going back to school. It kept me focused. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a, there was something that I needed to accomplish, right? It was, it was goal oriented. So I set a goal. I'm going to graduate college. I'm going to pick a degree that's going to kick my ass. going to be hard. I'm probably not going to love it, but I'm going to do it. Um, and so just that commitment to myself to finishing college and studying something as challenging as accounting, it's hard. I spent a lot of time studying. Um, so just keeping myself occupied with, with positive things. School mm-hmm. helped me. Um, school helped me uh, with, with my confidence, with, with just giving me something else to focus on that was positive. Um, Mm -hmm. and then I was able to like really just, I didn't really meditate, but like gratitude, right? So being grateful, being grateful for the shitty thing that just happened to me so that I had the opportunity to be in this spot to potentially change my life. Like I went from a life that I like didn't hate, but I was miserable. Like I was, I was struggling with a sick parent who was depressed and, and, and challenging, Mm -hmm. And, um, I was working at a job that I didn't really love. And so my life track was at that time was, was rough. Like it was hard to get out of bed in the morning. Um, I, I really, I really had a lot of challenges and I was young. And so to have this huge traumatic event happen, which was terrible, but like the silver lining is, I mean, I basically got to start my whole life over. Um, I got right. to now focus on myself and my dreams and my wants. It wasn't taking care of my mother or worrying about X, Y, Z. It was like, okay, now is my time. Like I, I put in the work. I have no regrets. I showed up as a good son. I did everything I could possibly have done. Um, so now is my time. So it just, but, but being grateful for the experience, mm-hmm. being grateful for the loss, being grateful for my mom, like all of those things. So just, Like really, I don't know that it was just like, it was practicing gratitude and and just trying to, to switch my frame of mind and just more, 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 more forgiveness, more love, more compassion for myself. When did, when did you start being so open about it? Has it always been that way? Cause I wonder if maybe that's also been a reason that, or a, a 
cause for you dealing with it is your openness to, to talk about it with other people and that's a great insight and i guess yeah that that probably is part of my therapy because i don't mind sharing my story um you know if if someone really wants to know and is is willing to take the time to listen i'm happy to share um because mm. i think so i have a friend lisa nichols uh, she's a world renowned uh, motivational speaker um and she says that your story doesn't belong to you mm -hmm. and if you keep it in the dark essentially you're doing the world a, a grave disservice so in essence like all of those trials and tribulations that we all experience need to be shared need to be communicated because we're all going through very similar things right like most of us at some point or another is going to experience loss of someone that they love tremendously that's had a mm -hmm. huge impact in their life and it's going to create a hole, right? But when you feel like you're on an island and you feel like you're the only one going through that, it's a lot harder to get through because you don't have support. You don't have inspiration. So, you know, I think Lisa's advice there is, is you know, be proud of your story and share it and so that it'll inspire others. So, I don't like, for me, it, it, I'm sure it has helped me communicate and process everything. Um, and if I'm completely honest with you, like, I... I'm still processing, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. ever go away. It's not like I'm, okay, I'm done with this. Like, <laughs> right. good. like I, holiday seasons can be challenging for me. Um, but my mom's birthday is five days after mine. Mm -hmm. um, Mother's Day falls right before or after, like, like within a week of her anniversary of, of passing. So like I'm constantly tested um, with, 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 the dark feelings, right? The sad, the pain, the anger. Um, but every year it gets better. And, and um, I never went to therapy, although I was encouraged to by several people throughout many years. Um, but I, I didn't, like, I didn't, intuitively, I didn't feel like therapy was going to help me because I already knew what was, what was wrong. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there, like, I went through this tragic thing. I was exposed. But, but for me, like, I just talk myself off the ledge, I guess. I mean, if I can be totally honest with you, I carried a lot of guilt for the first few years after she died because I had asked my mom to find my dad, which happened to, like, kind of get all of this going, right? But, you know, after a few years, I was beating myself up about it, and I was like, I just came to the fruition where, A, I was tired of taking the fall for that, um, and, B, I just came to be really honest with myself and say, look, you know, she was a grown woman and she made some poor choices, but those poor choices aren't your fault. Um, she didn't have to do that. And because you asked them to connect doesn't mean that you're responsible for the outcome. She's responsible for the outcome. Um, and she was in a place where she, you know, she was hurting and she was in pain and she was doing what she thought she needed to do. But as an individual, and that's a very individual decision that has nothing to do with me. Um, so it took me a while, but, um, you know, I came to the, like accepting, like, you know, it, it's okay. Like we all make mistakes. I don't hate her for it. I'm not mad at her for it. I love her to death. Um, I'll stand on, on any mountain and scream. She's the best mother in the world. Um, in fact, I took a rock with, with, with where we buried her, her information, GPS coordinates. I, I basically carried a rock up Kilimanjaro. <laughs> awesome. um, and took her with me so I, I'm extremely proud of my mom um, I, I'm very much who I am because of her and it's it's all good so I, 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 I didn't have any like professional help I just you know it's just something that I knew was right and you know fortunately I've had a lot of good support a lot of good advice um, and just people that love and care about me enough to listen and, and also you know share their vantage points and I guess the, the cumulative total is I was able to to kind of get through it in, in a more, you know, in a, in a positive light. So, but if I'm being totally honest with you, I'd say uh, I, 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 that's me. The, those mm -hmm. are my choices. We're at the end of the hour right now. So I guess I just would like to close with maybe like what kind of advice would you have for someone who's, you know, maybe dealing with something but wants to pursue their dream? How do they how do they get past that? And yeah, uh, I, I think that it's a good question. And I, I guess if I could have gone back, um, 
knowing what I know now, I probably wouldn't have stayed at that underwriter job. I probably would have left and started doing what I wanted to do because now I know that life happens no matter what. So if you're always waiting for something to be finished to the next chapter, like it's always going to be something. So you, you just need to start now. Um, so whether that means keeping your full-time job, dealing with your sick parent or sibling or relative and doing your side hustle, um, do it right. Because my side hustle, which, which is now my main hustle, but photography, like that was a creative outlet when I was just going through some, some heavy stuff, I would just take a camera and bail and Hmm. I'd go for a walk for two hours and take photos. And that helped me that, that art therapy really helped me through the process um, and turned into turned into a full fledged career. So I would say, you know, there's there's no better time than today. I know it's cliche, mm-hmm. but life's going to happen no matter what. So you might as well get started sooner than later, because if you wait for everything to be perfect, chances are you're going to be in a position of regret um, down the line where you're like, God, I wish I would have just done it because you can do it. There's enough time in a day. Um, I saw some funny social posts the other day and it was something like someone way busier than you is at the gym killing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think that's a funny, it's like, a, it's awesome. Right. Cause it's like how uh-huh. many of us are like, Oh, I don't want to go to the gym. I'm too busy or I don't have 30 minutes or whatever, but there's always someone that's like way busier than you. That's making time. Right. Um, so, so less excuses, take more ownership. It's not going to be easy. It's hard to do multiple things, um, com- compartmentalize those things while you're going through it. But, um, you know, it's, it's going to happen one way or another. Time's going to pass either way. So in my case, like had I gotten started, you know, in the beginning of the process, I would have been five or six years ahead uh, of when I actually started. So, mm-hmm. um yeah, you know, I would say that if anyone's going through some difficult stuff, um, know that you're loved, know that you're not alone, and know that your dreams still matter and that you need to make time to achieve those dreams, no matter what they are. So just make some time, dedicate some time, and chances are it'll ultimately help you get through whatever it is you're going through and put you in a better position whenever you're done with that and ready to to kind of pivot or 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 take it like uh you know let me use my example but if you want to be a photographer just start and you'll be in a better place when when you're ready to really blossom open up your own studio or go into your own business quit your full-time job whatever it is but um yeah just just start don't wait don't make excuses um just start all right that's the first episode Thank you for sticking around. Uh, Thank you to JR for sharing your story and being so open. Um, This sweet little ditty played at the top of the podcast and right here is by Blue Dot Sessions. And uh, thank you. Until next time.